Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Second World War Episode 20, The Third Reich Part 6, The 1932 Presidential Election. Before we get started today, I would like to give a recommendation for a podcast that I am personally not associated with in any way. I, I want to make that clear. We should check out the new Reconquista podcast. Host Sharon has done an excellent job on the History of the Crusades podcast and has now moved on to a new story. Listening to History of the Crusades back in 2014 is one of the reasons that I started podcasting in the first place. So check out Reconquista at crusadespod.com or through the link in the show notes. After the 1930 election, the political landscape in Germany would shift, and for the next several years, national politics in Germany would be in turmoil. While this turmoil was happening, a deadline would approach. The Weimar Constitution set the presidential term at seven years, which of course meant that presidential elections would occur every seven years, with 1932 being the end of one of those periods. The elections would also present another turning point. While the government after 1930 would sort of just stumble along under Bruning, after the elections of 1932 it would begin to shift rapidly. Today we will discuss the elections, their aftermath, and then the end of Bruning's time as Chancellor. As a reminder of the state of the Reichstag after 1930, there was deadlock. The Communists and the National Socialists had been able to gain enough seats during the 1930 election to effectively block any majority from being formed. This meant that no new cabinet would gain the votes that it needed to officially be created. There was also a general level of purposeful non-functioning within the chamber even when it was in session. Both the Nazi and Communist deputies did their best to disrupt proceedings, using both the constant stream of points of order and then just causing chaos by shouting or chanting, insulting or interrupting speakers by any means available. Reichstag sessions became almost unworkable even if there were items that could gain a majority. This gave President Hindenburg a lot of power and also those men close to him who were his advisors. The president had the ability to sign presidential decrees, which allowed the office, or those he appointed, the ability to run the most essential functions of the government. This is one of the reasons why the presidential elections of 1932 were so important. From 1930 to 1932, the office of the president, either in his person or with his consent, was almost the sole possessor of political power in Germany. It was very likely that if Hindenburg ran for president again, he would win. There were many war heroes in Germany at this time, but Hindenburg was the war hero, and he was one of the few which had been able to unite the support of all of the parties on the political right in the previous election in 1925. However, he was also very old. He would be 84 in 1932, and was in fact quite reluctant to even run for the office again. Initially, he would inform those around him that he would only continue to serve if he could just continue in office and didn't have to go through another election campaign. However, making such a change to the government was impossible without the intervention of the Reichstag. If the Reichstag chose to do so, it could extend the presidential term as, as long as it wanted to. But with such a dysfunctional Reichstag, this was never going to happen. And with the refusal of the Reichstag, Hindenburg would have to participate in the election. But unlike the elections of 1925, the elections of 1932 would see a reshuffle of political allegiances, with the Democratic Socialists actually winding up supporting Hindenburg's bid for the president, a testament to the turbulent times of the early 1930s. In the background of all of the political events of the early 1930s was the constant political violence that was occurring. From 1930 to 1932, the Nazi party would claim that 143 of its members would be killed in clashes with the socialists and the communists. The communists would claim 177, and the Reichsbanner, the social democratic paramilitary, would claim 50. While these numbers might seem low-ish, they hide the fact that while only a few hundred individuals would die, the number of wounded members would be in the thousands. The scale on which these street clashes occurred completely overwhelmed the existing ability of the German police to maintain order. There was also the ever-present problem of police bias, with the great concern of many policemen being not to maintain order, but instead to ensure that certain groups did not gain the upper hand. For the communists especially, the police represented the blunt instrument of capitalism, a system that was just as much a target of communist anger as the Nazis. 
This caused antagonism between the communists and the police, and the violence that would occur between the two groups was only outdone by that which occurred between the Nazis and the communists. While all of these actions would not directly alter the outcome of the presidential election, it is important background to the decisions that were being made both by the individual German citizens as well as groups within the nation, like political parties, workers' organizations, and others. The candidates and their political backing were the perfect representation of the shift in German politics in the seven years since the previous presidential election in 1925. In the first round of voting in that year, there had been seven major candidates, all supported by national political parties from across the political spectrum. However, in 1932, the election would only have four, three candidates representing more radical parties, and then Hindenburg left in the center. On the left, you had the communist Ernst Thalmann, who had also ran in 1925. During that election, he had received just over 6% of the vote. Stallman and the communists would always refuse to join in any coalition with other parties on the left when it came to national elections, and some would claim that this cost the Social Democrat-supported center party candidate Wilhelm Marx the election in 1925 because he lost the first vote by just the smallest of margins. Der Stahlhelm, which was a paramilitary organization built around war veterans and a party which supported the monarchist movement in Germany, would be represented by Theodor Dusterberg. There was also, of course, Adolf Hitler representing the National Socialists. When it came time to consider running for president, there were risks that had to be weighed for the Nazi party. Up until 1932, the party had been on an almost meteoric rise, and it was very likely that they would be defeated in the presidential race. The most important consideration was whether the possible negative impacts of a national loss on the party's image was more or less impactful than the negative perception that was sure to be the result of not even trying to put forward a candidate at all. The decision to run or not was hotly debated among Nazi party leaders, with the decision apparently swaying back and forth several times. For example, Goebbels would write in his diary at the time that Hitler decided to run on February 2nd, but then a week later, there were fresh debates about the best path forward, with no conclusive decision being made. The fourth candidate on the list was, of course, Hindenburg. While Hindenburg would be the favorite to win, the parties supporting him were very different than in 1925. He was always, officially, an independent candidate, and did not belong to any party. But in 1925, he had been supported by the parties on the right. However, those parties, or whatever was left of them at this stage, did not provide any real base of support, and instead Hindenburg found support from whatever was left at this stage of the political center, which was the center party, some of the smaller, more moderate parties, and most surprisingly of all, the Social Democrats. The support of Hindenburg by the Social Democrats is perhaps the best example of how concerned many political leaders were about the growing strength of the Nazi party and what might happen should Hitler be made president. The Social Democratic Party had strongly opposed Hindenburg as a candidate in 1925, and yet in 1932 they would join with other parties to make sure that he was victorious due simply to the fact that he was seen as the least bad option. William Schreier would say in the Rise and Fall of the Third Reich that, quote, all the traditional loyalties of classes and parties were upset in the confusion and heat of the electoral battle. To Hindenburg, a Protestant, a Prussian, a conservative, and a monarchist, went the support of the socialists, the trade unions, the Catholics of Bruning's center party, and the remnants of the liberal, democratic, middle-class parties. To Hitler, a Catholic, an Austrian, a former tramp, a national socialist, a leader of the lower middle classes, was rallied, in addition to his own followers, the support of the upper-class Protestants in the North and the conservative Junker agrarians and a number of monarchists, including, at the last minute, the former crown prince himself." End quote. And so you can see that the 1932 presidential election perfectly represented the political confusion that was happening in Germany at this time, as traditional allegiances and traditional parties found it very difficult to exist in the new reality of the early 1930s. After a hectic campaign which saw all of the parties campaigning all over Germany, although Hindenburg participated the least amount possible, the election would occur on March 13, 1932. When the votes were counted, the expected outcome occurred. Hindenburg received the most votes, by a pretty wide margin, almost 20% more than any other candidate. However, he did not receive enough votes to reach a majority. 
coming just 0.4% short at 49.6%, or just over 18.6 million total votes. Hitler would receive 11.3 million votes for just over 30%, Thalmann 4.9 million for 13%, and Dusterberg 2.5 million or 6.8%. This was not a bad showing for any of the three lesser candidates. Hitler's votes represented almost double what the Nazi party had gotten in the 1930 national elections, and Thalmann and Dusterberg did better than their party's performance in 1930. Within the rules of the presidential election, as had happened in 1925, with no candidate having received a majority of the votes, there was a second round of voting. The second vote would occur on April 10th, and in the intervening weeks, violence all over Germany increased as the various paramilitary organizations staged rallies and clashed with the others. On April 10th, the weather would be rainy, and this, along with growing election fatigue, caused there to be a million fewer votes than a month before. However, the outcome was once again the expected one, with Hindenburg gaining 53% of the vote, a 3% increase. However, Hitler's total went up almost 7%, with nearly 2 million more votes going his way. It was clear that for many, Hitler was the second choice. The elections represented a clear defeat of Hitler and the Nazi party, but it also clearly asserted that they were the most powerful singular political movement in Germany. Hindenburg had been supported by a wide array of political parties and still had to go to the second vote to win. It was a poor showing for the moderate parties that supported him. Immediately after the end of the presidential elections and before the final vote tallies were even counted, political leaders all over Germany shifted focus onto regional elections that occurred on April 24th. These elections would see state and city positions filled all over Germany and were seen as a very important part of the shifting political focus of the country. However, before those elections would occur, Bruning wanted to make a change. One of Bruning's major goals throughout 1932, and, and early 1932 especially, had been to bring Hitler and the Nazis into the government in some form. He desperately wanted them to stop being able to launch assaults on the government without having any actual responsibility and none of the burden of actually accomplishing something. He would never achieve this goal, but with the continued rise of support for the Nazi party, he decided to try and remove their most volatile and most powerful tool, the SA. On April 13th, the decree would be put in place from the office of the Minister of the Interior, General Wilhelm Groner, and the decree effectively outlawed the SA and the SS. The conversations for this decree had started even before the second presidential vote, with many German states requesting action from the national government to in some way reduce the violence throughout all of Germany. The decision was made on April 10th, although the announcement was made only a few days later after the results of the election were clear. The reason given for this action was that the Prussian police had raided the Nazi headquarters in Berlin, and they claimed that they had found documents that contained plans for the SA to immediately execute a coup d'etat if Hitler was elected president. This, along with all of the other violence, was used as justification for the decree. They also hoped that by removing the paramilitary wing of the Nazi party, support for the party would begin to dissipate. Hindenburg had just received a majority of German votes, and so theoretically, removing the violent group that posed the most direct threat to the government seemed reasonable. The response from the party was one of outrage. They would say that it was just another example in a long list of examples of the government trying to suppress their movement, which represented millions of Germans. They would also point out that it was a bit odd that other paramilitary groups, the Reichsbanner and the Stahlhelm, among others, and the Communist Red Front, most importantly, had been mysteriously unaffected by the decree. But Hitler and the other political leaders did not want to overplay their hands, just as their legitimate path to power strategy was beginning to show serious signs of success. In the regional elections of April 24, 1932, the Nazi party did quite well, gaining almost a third of the vote, or more, in several areas, like Prussia and Bavaria. Prussia was a very important state, and the only reason that the social democratic government that was in Prussia before the election maintained power after it was because in Prussia, unlike in Germany as a whole, the law stated that a government could not be dissolved until there was a majority for its replacement. With the vote split in a similar manner to the National Reichstag, the Prussian Landtag had no hope of finding such a majority, a problem that would only be resolved late in 1932 when the Prussian state government was dissolved by presidential decree. 
After the elections in April, Bruning was in just as precarious of a position as he had been in earlier months. These problems would be accelerated by General Kurt von Schleicher. Schleicher is an important player in our story for the next few episodes. He had been a major behind-the-scenes influence on German politics during the early 1930s, and he was close with Groner and Hindenburg and many others, and exercised no small amount of influence on the president himself. He also firmly believed that it was critical to bring the Nazi party into the government, and also not to put too many restrictions on their actions, because he saw the party as the most powerful tool for the right to use against the socialists and the communists. When the ban on the SA went into place, Schleicher felt that he had to act quickly, and that action would begin in mid-May. The Reichstag would meet on May 10th, and Groner would be confronted by the Nazi Reichstag deputies on his banning of the SA. The situation became very charged, with verbal abuse thrown at Groner, who eventually just got up and started to walk out of the Reichstag chamber. Schleicher would then inform him that he had lost the confidence of the army and should resign from his position as Minister of Defense. With Groner removed, Schleicher then targeted Brüning. Brüning only served at the pleasure of President Hindenburg. It was the president's power that kept him in position, because again, no Reichstag majority, and so Schleicher had to convince the president to remove him. This was relatively easy. Schleicher would just give the old general a nudge, claiming that it had been Bruning's fault that the presidential election had occurred at all, and this just added fuel to Hindenburg's pre-existing frustration with Bruning. After the SA ban had been put in place, Hindenburg had been frustrated that the same restrictions did not apply to other paramilitary groups on the left, who he saw as the real enemies of Germany. All these frustrations would result in Brüning being removed from his position as Chancellor on May 30th, 1932. Schleicher had worked out a deal with the Nazi leadership. Brüning would be removed, a new cabinet would be created by Hindenburg, there would be another round of Reichstag elections, and Hitler agreed to support the government until those elections, and then the one created afterwards. In exchange, the ban of the SA would be lifted. The elections would be set for July 31st, but during the interim, a new cabinet would be created under the leadership of one Franz von Papen. Papen was an aristocratic member of the Center Party, the Zemstrom, from Westphalia, and he was also a Catholic. The Zemstrom drew a lot of its support from German Catholics, but they did not all share the same views on the best path forward. Papen would be on the conservative side of the party, and he would attempt to bring the party closer to his views. Papen supported a return of some kind of authoritarian government, either monarchy or some other structure, and he rejected the democratic basis of the Weimar Constitution. However, and critically, Papen did not support a revolutionary or putschist method of change, instead believing that any change should take place within the confines of existing legality. During most of the 1920s, his attempts to move the party in this direction met with only marginal success. One of the problems was that the traditional Catholic elite, which had previously been an important part of the party, had fragmented after the First World War. Some were disappointed by the party's shift to the left on many issues in the aftermath of the conflict, and instead of sticking with the party on its new course, they instead found other political groups to join. Many would move over to the National People's Party, while some would move even further into the radical right. This type of shift in support was familiar to all of the political parties in Germany, especially the ones in the center at this time, and has been a major trend that we focused on in the last few episodes. Papen would generally stay the course, though, at least in terms of his rejection of revolutionary methods. Papen would be a supporter of the Brüning cabinet, and he maintained critical links between the cabinet and the German industrial leaders and aristocracy, both of which Papen was well connected with. However, as support for Brüning's policies and his position as Chancellor began to decay, Papen started looking for a way out. Or perhaps a way up. Part of this was out of simple self-interest, but there had always been an ideological rift between Brüning and Papen, and this only widened as Brüning was forced, out of lack of other options, to work more closely with the Social Democrats, who Papen saw as the great enemy. After Brüning was dismissed, Papen's close relationship with Schleicher and the president would allow him to be named Chancellor of Germany on June 1st. Much like Brüning, Papen did not have any real path to a majority in the Reichstag, but that was nothing new. To say that Papen's chancellorship was a surprise would be to undersell the shock experienced by many. 
Poplin was not particularly well known among the German public. And I love this quote from the French ambassador to Germany who would say at this point that, quote, The president's choice met with incredulity. No one but smiled or tittered or laughed because Poppin enjoyed the peculiarity of being taken seriously by neither his friends nor his enemies. End quote. Next episode, we will examine in more detail the curious case of Franz von Poppin and discuss his very, let's call it interesting, time as Chancellor of Germany. <laughs>